Welcome back to Out Loud, the Selective Mutism Podcast. I'm Chelsea. And I'm Anne, Chelsea's mom. Uh, last week we talked about managing masks, so if you want, if you're having trouble um, getting your kids to wear a mask, you should definitely check it out. We have some tips for how to make that easier, especially if your child struggles with sensory issues. This week we're doing an article review. We're taking a break from all the COVID-19 topics. Thankfully. Um, <laughs> yeah, we need I a need break. a break. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be reviewing an article called Functional Assessment-Based Intervention for Selective Mutism. So what I actually thought was interesting about this is um, Chelsea is familiar with the topic of functional assessment, which I'm not because I'm a mom and a nurse, but and I... <laughs> I'm a behavior analyst. Right. But I did think it was interesting after reading it and kind of getting into it that they are applying it to selective mutism because mm-hmm. there's not a lot of articles out there taking other philosophies or whatever belief systems. Right. I was drawn to this article because it's in ABA language, as I'd like to say. It's my language, like I understand the ABA terms and the fact that it's applied to selective mutism is really cool. Right, and so I actually learned quite a bit from reading the article. But I wanted to read the authors, because I think sometimes we forget to do Mm -hmm. that. And I'll also link the article in our show notes, so you could read it. Mm -hmm. Um, But the authors are Kern, Starosta, Cook, Bambara, and Grisham. Grisham. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, for the people that are non-technical, if you're a mom like me, don't get scared away from this um, reviewing a paper. Because I actually, there's a lot of good, there are some really good things in here that um, just kind of reinforce, I think, the things that we already believe about selective mutism. But it's good to have research to back it up. True. And we'll try to make it, like, plain English for everyone to understand. I can do that. (laughs) You can do the ABA part. Okay. So you're probably wondering, what is a functional assessment? That was my first question. (laughs) What What is a functional assessment? So... A functional assessment is basically just a process to identify the behavior and the purpose of that behavior. So we're looking at selective mutism, we're wondering why is this happening, and what are the different factors maintaining the selective mutism. Right, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I mean, I had no idea what functional assessment was, so um, actually what I learned, and I didn't know this, is that is, is this an ABA thing that all behavior is believed um, to sort of stem from, I guess, the need to either get either attention, uh, to escape, to obtain a tangible item, and the last one is there must be some sort of sensory reward, that all behavior sort of yes. brings one of those rewards. So those are the four functions of behavior. So we say that we're trying to figure out why a behavior is happening. It's one of those four, which there is some debate that it could be um, control as a fifth function that you're trying to gain control. But, Mm -hmm. and it can be more than one of these functions at the same time. So you could be trying to escape a situation while also getting attention for it, or you're escaping and you're getting something you like, Mm -hmm. like a tangible item. Okay, and then what about also, I think I saw something in this article about like the possibility of anxiety-driven behavior, because right. that's not one of the four, right? Okay, or so, is it? Okay, so we're trying to find out the why of behavior, and in the past, research has focused on like, um, oh, the cause of selective mutism is anxiety, but that doesn't, right. that's not an environment, it doesn't focus on environmental variables. Um, in behavior analysis, we focus on, like, we don't say the cause of behavior is anxiety or the cause of behavior is ADHD or the cause of right. behavior is bipolar, whatever. Um, we base it off of what is actually observable. Right. Okay. Yep. Not to mm-hmm. say that anxiety doesn't contribute to selective mutism because it does. I think you probably already said this then. The whole purpose of it is using functional analysis as a way to come up with... Functional inter- assessment. Oh, darn it. So the, <laughs> I keep well, doing that. We can that. talk about that. So the, I don't know if people even care, but if you're an ABA person, um, functional assessment is different from functional analysis. Um, so with a functional assessment, which is what we're talking about right. in this episode, um, we're just looking at kind of... We're using... Indirect, indirect measures. So we're taking 
interviews from people that know the child and we're interviewing the child and we're doing direct observations and then we're coming up with a hypothesis for why the behavior is happening. Okay. But in a functional analysis, we are using experimental control over the behavior. So we're changing the environment to see how the behavior changes in different conditions. Okay, so what I was so going to say... it's more of an say, experiment. What I was going to say then, what I meant to say, is so functional assessment is basically a way to come up with um, ways or interventions to treat the selective mm-hmm. mutism. So if we can identify the cause, the so, contributing factors, no. then we... No. Okay. So, no, it's okay. Functional assessment... So by doing this, we can't definitely say that we know the cause because we're not manipulating variables. We're not doing the experiment. Like, we don't have a solid answer for why it's happening, but right. we have a good idea because we right. we have a hypothesis. But if you did a functional analysis, you could probably narrow it down. <laughs> okay. But exactly. either way, either way. <laughs> The whole reason we're trying to learn about this is that then we can come up with ways to change the behavior. Right. We need to come up with to treat selective mutism. We need an intervention that is based on the function. So we need to know why the behavior is happening to have an effective intervention. Okay, I got it. Yes. And I thought so. They they start off the article talking about like um, internalizing behaviors, and then they came up with saying like. Internalizing behaviors are usually like covert behavior, so it makes it doubly hard covert to observe meaning them. Covert inside of your body. In, right, or like out thoughts of, and feelings. Right, hidden or... Not measurable. Okay. Or observable. Okay. <laughs> so it makes it harder to um, determine why something's happening when you don't know what a child is thinking or what they're right. feeling. And I just sort of wanted to point out too that, to me, you know, it's kind of obvious or whatever, but... Before you can make change, you first have to identify um, or recognize, I don't want to say the problem, any, well, usually any problem in life, right? You can't change, you can't change it unless you're actually willing to admit there's a problem. Yeah. So the article kind of states like the first step is Mm self-recognition of the child or the person with selective mutism before you can actually Mm -hmm. change the behavior. True. Which I thought was kind of interesting because a lot of the parents that we've had contact with, we see a lot of parents questioning, should I tell the child they have selective mutism? Right. Should I talk about it? Should I just pretend it's not there and just go through, mm-hmm. you know, life trying to help them? And we've answered that before. And I think mm-hmm. you don't have to slap a diagnosis on it, especially if they're young. You could just talk about it openly, though. Right. So I think Not ignore it. Exactly. And I think this article actually even proves that further to say that, you know, it's just you can't change something unless first you recognize that it needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. (laughs) I just wanted to make that point. And again, for people that, um, you know, maybe aren't familiar or who are just listening for the first time, the article does define selective mutism um, being characterized by the occurrence of speech only to select people or in select situations um, among individuals with otherwise functional speech um, and the ability to comprehend language. So they can speak in one setting, um, but for whatever reason, in another setting or situation, they're unable to speak. Mm -hmm. Did you want to go over like the the children that are in this article? Yeah, so there's only two participants in this study. Um, one of them was a 13-year-old girl who is Hispanic and in 8th grade, mm-hmm. I believe. And she is fluent in both English and Spanish. Um, but she spoke freely at home and with her family. I guess they did assessments on her English and she she speaks both fluently. Um, so it's not an issue of just being bilingual and not knowing the language well. Um, But she rarely spoke in the presence of unfamiliar people, and at school she used a communication book to communicate with teachers and peers, so they would ask her questions and she could answer by writing the response. Um, She also used gestures, like nodding, shrugging. Yeah, she's 13 years old. She's in 8th grade. Mm -hmm. Um, She had had selective mutism since beginning school in kindergarten or whatever. Um, She was held back in 6th grade because of her selective mutism interfering with her academic abilities. 
That makes me mad because I feel like you mm-hmm. can assess it differently. So she was unable to pass the oral language requirement That's for the class, so... but she was able to pass the written exam. That's annoying to me. Mm-hmm. Like she has the skills, she just can't do it in that setting. Right. So she was actually labeled. Her school di- school district labeled her as emotionally um, having behavioral disorders. Um, due to her selective mutism and she was actually put in a learning disabled class because Mm -hmm. the school felt it would be more supportive for her so this really kind of got me going um, (laughs) because I have actually in a lot of the groups seen parents putting the question out should I have my child labeled like emotional disturbance um, in order to get them other services I don't think so I don't think so either and then to see it in this article, I'm like, okay, this is a real thing. This yeah. is really happening. I think they just don't know what to do with um, kids with this diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Second child is an 11 year old fourth grade student. I think it's a boy. He's a boy. Yep, Sean. Uh, Sean. I'm assuming these aren't real names. Mm-hmm. Um, he had not spoken at school since kindergarten, and he communicated only with his bod- bodily movements, but he spoke openly at home with family, and neighborhood friends, just not at school. Right, he did head nodding, hand gestures, shoulder shrugging. So both, I know they say this kind of at the end of the article, they say these children have like mild anxiety, which I think a lot of people with selective mutism have maybe more anxiety than these um, children, but the takeaway is just everyone is different, Mm -hmm. and like an individual approach is the best way to get an effective treatment plan. Yeah, and so just keep that in mind that these kids are yeah. mild, mildly anxious, according to this article. I was just going to point <laughs> out that the article also says that Sean had low academic performance, um, and they suspected an underlying emotional disturbance. <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe a learning disability, or they just don't know how to mm-hmm. um, evaluate him. Who knows? So both of the kids were, um, what, evaluated, or they were assessed uh, in the school system, because yep. that was where they were displaying their, I guess, symptoms yeah. or characteristics of being selectively mute. Mm-hmm. So they measured, well, just in the study, they focused on vocal responding. They were trying to increase vocal responses. Um, so they measured two different kinds of vocal responses, independent, actually three kind of. So they independent vocal response was a response... A voice response appropriate to the question, audible from a distance of five meters and occurring within 30 seconds following a teacher question. Um, So if they didn't respond within 30 seconds to a question the teacher prompted, either by repeating the question or rephrasing it, um, altering it, or instructing the child to call on another peer to help, that I thought was a really neat that's idea. That's a smart idea, yeah. Because we had never thought of that, mm-hmm. but I think that's kind of neat because you can get out of answering the question. Yeah. But to do that, you have to verbally ask a friend but or somebody I don't know. for help. I'm assuming that that would be hard because a lot, I mean, speaking personally, mm-hmm. a lot of kids with selective mutism have a hard time with names. Saying names is harder. Yeah, and I don't know how you could actually do that. If you can't answer the question, how can you verbally ask a friend? Well, it could be like a longer response that they're looking for, and you could, if it's easier to just say your friend's name. I guess. Mm-hmm. And they also measured prompted vocal responses, so when they're being prompted. So that's the same definition as the independent response, except it's prompted. Um, so the response occurs within 30 seconds of a teacher prompt. And then the third one that kind they kind of counted only for Sean was the spontaneous in- initiations. So um, any voice utterance audible from a distance of five meters and generated spontaneously rather than following a question or a prompt. And I think the reason that only for him is they, they started at different levels. Yeah, whatever. yeah. Every kid starts in a different place. And I think he just happened to have more spot. I would assume, like, that all of a sudden he was, like, initiating things and spontaneously speaking. They're like, oh, we should be taking data on this, too. So I Mm -hmm. think they included that. And then they also, they used direct methods and indirect methods for the functional assessments. So a record review, which includes the history of their selective mutism. It identifies the effectiveness of interventions they've tried before. 
And then they also use the functional assessment interview, which is questions that focus on um, the variables that relate to the selective mutism and what are their strengths, their weaknesses, their interests, their academic and social functioning, and how they communicate in various settings. And they all, I really like this about this um, study. They interviewed the students. Right, and gave, let them have input. Mm-hmm. So they asked students questions about what variables contribute to them not being able to speak in certain situations, and then interventions that might help them speak. They were able to give input on those. Um, they could give the input non vocally as well, which was cool. They kind mm-hmm. of like had a survey where they finished the um, finished sentences. They also had questions about what interventions would be least intrusive, which is always important because you don't want to be different and stand out. So an example of a question is like, in which situation is it easiest to talk? And then um, they could rank their classrooms like their classes, like, oh, it's easier in math class to talk because this person's in that class. Mm -hmm. Um, And they also rated who they're most comfortable speaking to, which is all very useful information. Right, so it's nice to actually get the the children's input. And give them more control over their treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, And they also use direct methods, which is direct observation. So in different school settings, they were observing the the student's behavior so they were taking notes on any interactions they had and what type it was whether it was like vocal or non-vocal written whether it was initiated or a response to someone else Um, and they took note of what class it was in and who was like the other individuals who were involved so they came up with hypotheses for why their selective mutism was occurring so they came up with a hypothesis for the first participant. When a response from Beatrice is required, teachers provide non-vocal means of responding to obtain a response and or allow her to escape a vocal response. Right. So they, they came up with that based on the direct observations. They're seeing the teachers allowing her basically to escape vocally responding. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing that I thought was interesting about this, and I mean, I can see it but it's I just thought it was kind of neat to acknowledge that when a teacher has a selective mutism child in the class the teachers also kind of admitted or they determined that the teachers changed their behavior of the SM child to accommodate them almost to make it easier on them so direct observations that suggested selective mutism may have shaped the teacher's behavior Mm -hmm. which I can definitely see from when you were a child because some teachers just totally stop asking you questions it happens with parents as well true yeah right so they would ask her questions where she could either shake or nod her head um, give a thumbs up um, write the answer in a notebook those are all ways where she could escape the verbal Mm -hmm. which I kind of think is interesting again (laughs) because we all do those things for SM children as a way to help them which I guess is okay, but you need to move past that. Right, you need you a can't plan to keep move that. forward. Right. And I definitely think I had teachers that just kind of gave up almost. Mm-hmm, yeah. And kind of stopped calling on me. But I don't know. Which I probably was happy about, but right. it wasn't challenging me. <laughs> and I don't know if it was really giving up, though, or maybe they thought they were Helping. being nice to yeah. you. Yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> but just to point out for everyone that's doing that, and I was guilty of it too, um, it's good short term, but it's not good long term because mm-hmm. you need to move past that to function right. in life independently. Yes. Okay. Back to the article. So, <laughs> so the same thing happened with Sean. His his teachers were um, allowing nonverbal, nonvocal responses, um, such as nodding, or his peers as well, which is interesting that the other kids were um, changing their behavior for him. Um, And I thought this was kind of, because I think we've all experienced this. It says, Sean's teacher mentioned that she did not want to exacerbate Sean's condition by bugging him to speak in the class. So it's kind of like what we were just mm -hmm. talking about. So to, you know, trying to, I think in a way, protect the child. Right. Which I can understand that because if the 
if he's not ready for it and she like just put him mm. on, put the spotlight on him in front of the whole class like that could push him back so they did ask the kids right whether i think you may have already said this whether the child would you feel more comfortable talking to the teacher or talking to a peer so I just think it's important mm-hmm. to ask those questions because you're going to have more success if you can, yeah. if the child can identify, you know, what they're more comfortable with. Right. And it's different in every class. Like they did say in this uh, article, like if you have the best friend in the class, mm-hmm. then that one, cl- you know, math class is going to be different than science class. Right. Because there are different variables in that class. So they have kind of a controversial hypothesis for Sean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um They say, let me read it exactly. Um, When a vocal response is requested from Sean, he does not respond in order to obtain positive attention from peers and teachers. So they're basing this off of a student interview where Sean actually said that he liked that other students protect him and look out for him because of his problem. Which, that doesn't mean you love the attention, it just means... I'm glad kids are nice to me, even though I'm different. Yeah, when I read that too, that bothered me. Because they're insinuating that he's doing it on purpose to get attention from his ki- from the other kids. But they're also saying that they observed Sean on the playground. And mm-hmm. um, they saw that it seemed like he liked attention from other students when they tried to get him to talk. So other kids would come up and try to get him to talk. And he would smile and follow them around the playground. So that's what their hypothesis is based on. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit upsetting to me, too. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm not buying it. But okay, keep going. I think a lot... Okay, so I think that for... If we go back to those four um, functions of behavior, I would say that it's heavily escape for selective mutism. You're trying to escape aversive situations, and it's just that overwhelming anxiety that you're trying to get out of the situation. So but, from yeah, from our experience, that's the most understandable. I'd say it's not totally impossible for Sean to enjoy his attention, but you mm-hmm. get more attention if you're interacting with kids, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Based on the hypotheses they came up with, interventions right. that fit the hypotheses. So, so for Sean, they gave him the reward of um, extra playground time with a mm-hmm. friend. So he got to hang out with his friends and get more attention. <laughs> um, they also had teachers asking questions in a way that kind of required a vocal response, and then if it wasn't um, vocal response, they'd like re-ask it or rephrase it. They would ask easier questions that require less effort to answer. Um, they would also they let the first participant know how many questions she would be asked at the start of each period, so that she felt prepared. And I think you probably would have liked that. You always wanted to know what to expect. Yes. It was better than not knowing what to expect Mm -hmm. and just sitting there dreading it the whole, you know, the whole class. It's scarier when it's um, unpredictable. So I just thought that might be a goal. If you're trying to come up with goals between your child and the teacher, maybe you could have a set number, you know, to kind of ask you one question for each period through the day. And that way you both know the rule, you know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So that's a good goal to have. I also think it would be cool to have a little like code with your teacher. Mm -hmm. Like if you know that she's going to ask you three questions, like have like a special like look that she gives you before she is about to ask it. Mm -hmm. Because I remember my first grade teacher used to like look at me and I like give her a little nod and then she would ask me the question. So that's a good tip. That's interesting. We didn't plan that. That was just happening. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And they did do baseline data, too, yes. just to put that out there, where there were no questions asked. Oh, Sean also um, earned tickets. I guess his teacher mm-hmm. has this going in their classroom for everybody, So, but they made it like um, specific for Sean that he would earn tickets if he met his daily goal of vocal responses. So like if the goal was two responses, he would earn his tickets, and then... At the end of the week, he could choose prizes from the mystery box. Yeah, we didn't talk about baseline, but during baseline, it was just normal classes. And no, I guess no questions were asked of the students. Data for both of the students indicated that teachers did not ask any questions that required vocal responses. And the students also didn't produce any spontaneous vocalizations during baseline. 
So after baseline, they started the interventions that we just talked about, where the teacher started asking questions. Um, I think the first participant had one question asked daily, and that increased in increments of one whenever she met the criterion or met her goal. Using these like interventions that they came up with, using their functional analysis, functional assessment, that the prompted responses kind of decreased over time. It was prompted and independent resp responses in the beginning, and it kind of, over time, there was more independent responding to questions, and the prompted kind of faded out towards the end, which is a good sign. So basically, the children were answering the questions independently by the end of the study. And both teachers responded that they felt that um, the students would continue to make this a permanent change mm -hmm. in their behavior. Which makes sense, because I always say it's like breaking the ice, like once you do it one time, it's easier the next time. Mm. It's kind of getting over that initial response of your peers mm -hmm. um, reacting to you speaking. And I know this is a study, but um, I think it's so important, right, to have teacher buy-in. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously. I mean, you know, this was a study, so these two teachers were engaged. But, you know, I think the whole point of it or whatever to apply it to real life is obviously the teacher has to be engaged or willing to, um, you know, make changes in the classroom or to go mm -hmm. along with um, different interventions. And to change their own behavior because they made... An environment that kind of um, it promoted non-vocal speech where we want to be trying to encourage vocal speech mm -hmm. using baby steps <laughs> gradually over time. The, both the teachers said that the information they got from the assessments was very helpful um, with work, help them work with the students better and probably understand them better because I think a lot of teachers don't really get it. Right. Um, I think it was really great that they included the student input because that allowed them like a more um, personal mm -hmm. Which I think is actually the most important aspect of this study. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you'd have to, you know, gather that information from the selective mutism um, person or child in a comfortable setting where they're willing to share mm -hmm. that information with you. Um, but like these kids ranked, they were able to, I think, you know, kind of backing up here a bit, it's so important for children to be able to recognize their emotions mm -hmm. so that they can identify the emotions. You know, that's, it's just so important. I remember that was one exercise that you had um, when you were, you know, I think preschool, you know, you wouldn't show any emotion. And so it's hard to discuss your feelings with you if you don't know emotions yet. So our assignment, I think, uh, when, at one point was to go home and for Dad and I to really, like, act out our emotions, you know, overly, you know, if we're sad to over, you know, be really dramatic, um, which you thought was pretty funny. <laughs> but yeah. it was, it's really important to label emotions and teach what emotions are mm -hmm. um, so that, like, kids in this study were a little bit older, but then they can tell you how it makes them feel, different situations. Right which we could do another whole episode on that, just emotions, teaching emotions. Yeah, but I think it's like, it's very thoughtful, I guess, to include or even try to figure out what the child feels and what they're comfortable with and what kind of treatments they think would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And even at any age, you can do that. Yeah. And I always say, like, why don't you just talk to the <laughs> child? I don't know. Like, try to figure out what would help them because I'm sure they want to make mm -hmm. progress. And one thing and, I used to do for you, um, we used to have, <laughs> being a nurse, right? So we have the pain scale, zero to 10. You know, you say to a patient, you know, rank your pain for me, zero to 10. 10 is the most pain you've ever felt. Zero is no pain at all. So I kind of made a similar version for you from zero to five for not scary at all to really scary. And then we would talk about different situations and I'd have you point to which face mm. Um, where you were at on the scary scale. <laughs> Elisa Shippenbloom does that as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. This cat treatment. Yes. We talked about that 
in one of our episodes. So we used to use that for goal setting mm -hmm. because if it's not so scary, right. then you were able to do positive things and have a sense of accomplishment. And then we would gradually just make it a little more scary each right. time. It help you, helps you gauge like what is possible right. at that moment. So that's what these kids did in this study. They ranked like the teacher asking them mm -hmm. questions and, you know, where that was on the scale. And so many of these kids feel like they don't have control because they can't communicate in certain situations and they can't advocate right. for themselves. So I think having control over their own treatment is very empowering and effective. Right. So again, I think you need to recognize with the child that there's an issue yes. and then you can talk about it yes. to make it better. And then they go into all the limitations of the studies, which is not the fun part. Um, they talk about, we talked about this before, how the children in this study had mild anxiety symptoms, um, neither demonstrated intense, like an intense anxious behaviors, um, which many selective mutism, people with selective mutism do have very intense anxiety. So some of these interventions probably wouldn't be as successful with every child because they were asking questions in front of the entire class, which you may have to start smaller and work your way up using gradual exposure approaches. And maybe a smaller group size. But yeah. 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 So, okay. I think the takeaway here is that it's important to ask why and to try to figure out for each specific child why is this happening and why are they having so much trouble and it could be different for every child but I think we kind of found out what we already know about selective mutism which mm -hmm. is that rescuing the child maintains the behavior and that is the most common reason it continues mm -hmm. and we can focus on reducing anxiety and changing the environment to make it more manageable for the child and that will encourage speaking. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thank you for listening to this episode of Out Loud, the Selective Mutism Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please go leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. 